During my uh, opening earlier, I talked about divine orchestration, so I want to talk a little bit about the long and winding road that brought me here to ASON. So you may pick up on an accent if you don't know where it's from. It's because it's been washed out from 30 years of living in the U.S. August 17th of this year marks 30 years um, immigrating from Germany. So I moved here in 1994 when I was 16 years old. Uh, graduated from the University of Florida. Go Gators! <laughs> I know there's got to be some nose in here somewhere, right? Yeah. Anyway, so after graduating from University of Florida, I uh, had a long and colorful career. I moved to Missouri. Uh, I met my wife at a career fair at the University of Florida recruiting for the company I was working for and she didn't realize I interviewed her for two jobs. <laughs> and she got both. So, and then we moved to Georgia when my son Jonas was born. He's also with us tonight. And then we moved to Wisconsin and we stayed there for seven years. And then family reasons took us back to Florida. Yeah, I became a tech CEO of a startup, a Norwegian startup who incorporated in the US and needed someone to head up that business. And I ran that company for five years. We came up on COVID and I transitioned out of that role, made up for some lost times because after you know, five years of running a tech startup and working the kind of hours it takes to successfully run a tech startup, you lose a lot of quality time with your family. And then you spend a lot of time compensating for lack of doing things that you enjoy by buying things that you think can buy you happiness when you realize material possessions really can't do that. Tough lesson to learn. Uh, one of those material possessions was a sailboat, a 36-foot Beneteau that I owned for three years and sold it in December of 2021. And this letting go of that material possession is what's responsible for me being here today. So Bob and Judy Baldwin said in the audience, uh, Judy talked earlier, I listed that boat on probably, I would say, mid-December of 2021. So it's called the 15th. And it was on a whim. I thought about it for a good six months before saying, yep, okay, I'm ready to let it go now. And uh, it was listed for no more than three days when my broker called me and said, uh, we have an offer. And two weeks later, we closed. And then uh, the fun starts. Because <laughs> the, uh, the captain who was hired to relocate the boat from Fort Pierce to Coco neglected to check that the seacock was open for the raw water intake for the uh, diesel engine. So they burned out the impeller. So here I am on the first Saturday of not owning a boat, which means I can actually sleep in because we're not using the boat this morning. I get a phone call from said captain, and she said, well, I, uh, I opened the seacock. And I said, well, it was already open, so you closed it. <laughs> so we went to, well, went to the boat, uh, checked it out, figured that the impeller was busted, and it was a Saturday. It was tough to find a part, but after a few hours and a few phone calls to connections, I was able to track down a part, popped the part in, got them going. They were able to make it to Coco after a few squally days. And we, we became friends ever since then. A few weeks later, I was on the boat uh, teaching them everything about the boat. Boats are not like cars. For those of you who own boats, you know that, that uh, they all have their own wiring personalities and everybody does something a little bit different. So I think they appreciated having access to the person who owned the boat before, which I didn't when I bought it. I got it out of a hurricane hole a few years before then, and it took me months to figure it out, figure out all the the gremlins in that boat. So, you know, taught them how to sail the boat, and we've been friends ever since. The very first time we went sailing, Alan was also on that boat. A few months later, I was invited by Judy and Ellen to join them on our annual pilgrimage to Israel. And uh, I said yes, and that's where the fun really started, because my roommate, was our pastor from South Asia. And he is a heavy snorer. 
and I did not have earplugs with me. I tried desperately to furnish some out of Kleenex and lotion and try to pack my ears and it, it was relentless, it didn't work. So after a little while, I just, I, I, I succumbed. I just, you know, I was reaching over and I was touching him on the shoulder and I said, hey, you're snoring. And he opened his eyes, his eyes and he looked at me and I looked like this with my hair down and he punched me in the face. <laughs> So this is how I got introduced to our pastor from South Asia. That was night number one in uh, Israel, sleeping on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, a few days later in the old city of Jerusalem, Ellen asked me to join her on a mission trip going to South Asia. We went on that mission trip last November. Uh, shortly after that, we went to the Dominican Republic. So being in the field and seeing you all saw the numbers earlier for those of you who watched the video. 737 nationals in nine countries planting over 200 churches, building seven schools, 15 homes, providing transportation for the hundreds and sponsoring over 1,300 kids. Those are big numbers, but it doesn't really resonate until you're actually in the field and you observe what you can only observe when you're in the field. And the region we are working in, in South Asia, that country only has about a 2% Christian population, but the specific local field that we're in has 0.1 to 0.5. So virtually none. And there's heavy persecution to the point to where we, when we visited our villages and our uh, village churches, we were in the backseat of a car covering up with a hoodie, make sure that nobody saw us come in the one dirt road leading into the village. Because at the end of the day, all it takes is a mob gathering on that dirt road and you're not getting back out of that village. But the welcoming we received at that village church was humbling. Because I know who I am. I mean, I put my, my pants on legs first like everybody else does. And I felt not deserving of being, you know, greeted with flower petals and flower lays around my neck and smiles and love radiating from people. There's a picture on our website on the very top. Actually, if you want to put that up, Timothy, on the, the financial website, if you scroll up to the top, in the header on that, actually. Yeah, very top on the right side. That is that village church. And I've never seen so much love on so many faces. And Ellen can tell you stories about how that church has progressed over the years. And the transformation is amazing. So the work we do is crucial. The difference we make is enormous. And there is endless amount of work to be done. So just to talk about our financial needs, if you want to scroll back down to the financial needs, a lot of work to be done. So right now we are uh, buying land and construct uh, constructing three new churches for you know, $375,000. That's the money that we have yet to raise. Uh, we still have to finish up construction of the mother church for $179,000. We have to build boundary walls because if they are going to be safe worshiping, they need to have walls. Just going from their home to the church is risky enough. We want to make sure they're safe when they get there. Uh, eucalyptus and wheat planting. Uh, this is part of economic development because uh, something that truly sets ASON apart from uh, other ministries is that we incubate. Our goal is to get them going, get them to a point to where you know, they are economically developed enough to where they can self-sustain. And when they're ready to self-sustain, no longer need our help, we move on and we do it again somewhere else. Eucalyptus and wheat planting is something that is going to produce revenue. That's actually going on, going on top of a uh, Christian cemetery that we purchased land for because there was no place for Christians to be buried in that country. Especially during COVID, that was a really tough time. Uh, in Ghana, three more classrooms to finish for 73,000, 2,000 for baptismal, and just ongoing uh, Dominican Republic is our most mature ministry. Uh, right now, just uh, sponsorships and scholarships is what we need there. So there is uh, a lot of work to be done. The work is important. 
It makes a huge difference, and I encourage every one of you to join us on the mission trip so you can see it for yourself, because the, just the difference in, in lifestyle, yet the joy that they have in their hearts is amazing. I think anyone should see that.